welcome to Ancient Amnesia Podcast. I'm Josh, your host, and I'm back with part two of my conversation with Michael Cremo as we discuss the Vedic universe, quantum questions, and the emerging science of consciousness. Michael Cremo is a research associate of the Bhaktivedanta Institute, specializing in the history and philosophy of science. His persistent investigations during the eight years of writing Forbidden Archaeology documented a major scientific cover-up. You can visit Michael and review his work at ForbiddenArchaeology.com. We hope you enjoy the show. Stay tuned for more. When you're forming your opinion of modern humans on this planet, what what is what? Because we know that these creatures, like the Neanderthals, the uh, you know Australopithecines, the all of the different hominid types, we know that they were existent. And so, what it sounds like to me is that you have this coexisting uh, scene of multiple different types of hominids, multiple different types of, of uh, beings, planet. And in I don't your think- opinion. Oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, what, what do you? What is your vision of this uh, fifty hundred million year period as we find all of these different hominids? What, what, in your opinion, was going on? Do we have, <clears throat> do we have this uh, modern human uh, coexisting with all of these different types, and they all have different origin points uh, individually? Uh, what, wh- how would you describe that hundred to fifty million year scene as we go back in time? Well, again, I'm I'm going to put out front, as I usually do, that my thoughts about these things are influenced by my studies in the Vedic cosmology of ancient India. And those writings tell us there are 400,000 human-like species scattered throughout the entire universe so basically that's the kind of picture that I see it's not just limited to this planet you know it includes you know these extraterrestrial kinds of entities as well but as far as this planet goes I mean even you know, the ancient Indian texts like the Ramayana uh, describe beings that res- very much resemble the modern scientific picture of ape men or hominids. Uh, creatures with ape like bodies, but with human like abilities, a very simple level of material culture, but with the ability to use language and things like that. So that's, you you get descriptions of ape men in these ancient Sanskrit writings. So the basic picture that you get as you look at the whole body of evidence is one of coexistence rather than of evolution and I would say that the human form has always coexisted with various other human-like and ape-like forms and that's the actual pattern that emerges if you look at all of the evidence and not just the small fraction of evidence that's included in the current the current textbooks of anthropology and archaeology and human history so that's a fact mm-hmm. uh, now <clears throat> I would also point out that according to the way I look at things any type of body whether it's an eight body or a human body or a plant body or an insect body or a fish body, or a bird body, is a vehicle for a conscious self. I mean, that's one of the outstanding problems in modern science, the origin of consciousness. And most scientists today are convinced that it's a, that what we call consciousness and mind and things like that is something that's produced 
by chemicals in the brain. I don't accept that. I think consciousness has its own separate existence apart from the body, apart from the brain, apart from matter. It's a, it's just as fu- a fundamental thing as matter is. As a matter of fact, I would probably say it's more likely that matter comes from consciousness than consciousness comes from from matter. And I think that's the significance of all this paranormal research that was done by Wallace and which continues to be done by many researchers today. You know, the experiments in uh, consciousness studies, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, reincarnation, memories, and things of that sort. It all tends to suggest that consciousness is something that exists apart from the body so and that, that seems to uh, uh, that same level of discovery um open-mindedness and then later um sequestering or knowledge filtration seems to have happened in the field of physics where we had some of the heaviest hitters of physics as they were discovering quantum realms uh, such as Mac, Max Planck, who who says all matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force. We must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter, and that's the father of you know quantum uh, theory. So it seems that these same things were happening in science as we as I, I have found and discovered that many of the greatest physicists and scientists of the uh, the early 20th century uh, had 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 to admit that it seems that that there is more of a mental matrix to uh, matter, and we know that Darwin, um, you know, he was not able to see inside the cell. He was only to see he only saw the cell some type of protoplasm, and that once we began to understand that the cell had sub uh, cellular mechanics that are so fine tuned and uh, to such a degree of advancement and uh, complexity that uh, they were almost forced to believe and and admit that there had to have been an intelligent force uh, manifesting these these forms. And so um, I I think that classical physics and classical quantum uh, theory tends to uh, support the idea of uh, conscious uh, mind being the matrix uh, of, of matter. Well, I think you're absolutely right about that. The, I mean, it's interesting that the quantum description of matter, which mainly deals with matter and its micro forms, you know, atoms and subatomic particles and things of that nature, matter in the quantum sense has features that are very mental in in one sense, like the whole idea of quantum entanglement, you know, that particles at a distance can be linked to each other in a, in a manner that really can't be explained. You know, though you do one thing to uh, a particle here and it, a particle at a distance, a great distance flips the opposite way. It's, it's very spooky in a sense and it it leads to a concept of matter as you say that's part of a matrix of consciousness and mind so i think you're right about that as far as prominent physicists being involved in research that leads in that direction i've i've always been fascinated by the example of Marie and Pierre Curie. You, know, you read about the Curies in every introductory physics textbook, even down to high school level. Uh, they're famous, especially Marie Curie, uh, for their work in discovering radium and doing work connected with the phenomenon of radioac- radioactivity. You know, both. Marie and Pierre, they were husband and wife, got Nobel Prizes in physics. And that's in every textbook. But what you don't read 
in the physics textbooks today is that they were heavily involved in psychical research. They were part of a group of uh, prominent scientists in Paris early in the 20th century who were conducting such research. The group did uh, a series of experiments with an Italian medium, a lady named Eusebia Palladino, and uh, she had psychokinetic or mind over matter abilities. On one occasion, they had her in the Psychology Institute in Paris, and Pierre Curie and Marie Curie were there. You know, they were carefully controlling this woman, making sure that she couldn't move a muscle without their observing it. And in the presence of this woman, and what Pierre Curie, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, called perfect conditions of observation, they saw the scientists observed a table floating about a meter off the ground in the presence of this woman without anything touching it. And, you know, Pierre Curie wrote to his prominent physicist friends, you know, we have to take these things into account if we're going to have a complete picture of reality. And, you know, Marie Curie noted these things in her diaries. It's, it's just something that has been filtered out. You know, people think, okay, if they think, okay, science, that means very strict, very positivist, evidence-based, and they have a very narrow conception of what science actually is based on their understanding of, of the carefully edited pictures we get of scientists like Wallace and the Curies. You know, they're, it's just not mentioned. Mm -hmm. Once I was, you know, Marie Curie was originally from Poland. So I remember once I was giving a lecture in Poland and I kind of touched on this hidden history of physics and I mentioned Marie Curie and Pierre Curie's role in doing this kind of psychical research. And in the audience, there was a professor, a physics professor uh, from Poland. And when I mentioned that Marie Curie was involved in psychical research, he just shouted out, no, it can't be true. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. Unbelievable. You know, and once at, at another university in Europe, you know, I was giving a lecture on the hidden history of physics to an audience of physics professors and graduate students in physics. And afterwards, one of the physics professors came up to me and he said, because I mentioned all these things, you know, the, the work that the Curies had been doing and other prominent physicists. And, and you know, he told me, you know, I'm, I'm glad you gave this talk. He said, by day, I'm a plasma physicist. I study the physics of superheated gases. He says, but privately at night, I'm, I'm doing some paranormal experiments with my son i sit i sit in one room and i flip a coin and my son sitting in the other room has to tell me if it's heads or tails he said my son is getting 80 percent correct which is just totally unexpected according to the normal laws of physics if you've got something that has 50 percent chance of happening like a coin being heads or tails if a person is asked to say what it is she he should get you know 50 percent correct or something like that right so to have his son getting 80 percent correct was really amazing he said i would never 
say this to any of my colleagues here because they think I'd gone completely crazy, but I feel safe in talking to you about it because I could see you're a little bit open-minded. So I think there are many cases uh, like that all over the world that there are many scientists who from the external point of view look totally orthodox in their ideas, but privately they have other thoughts and may even be, be doing some experiments that go along with those thoughts. Right, because at the end of the day, they, they have to keep a job and they have to raise their families and they have to keep their careers. And they know that by putting themselves out there, they're in threat of, uh, you know, losing all of those credentials and losing their, and that's happened uh, multiple times uh, in anthropology and archaeology as they've put themselves out there and, and then lost um, funding and uh, things like that. There's many of those cases. I find also it interesting that it seems that ancient scripture since we we know that you started with the vedas and, and valid validating the vedas through scientific research i feel that there is a spiritual revolution that science is going to that is science is beginning to get itself into and, and i believe that it's happening on all fields um you know through astronomy we have found that when the beginning of the the Big Bang was being discovered through Edward uh, Edwin Hubble and and being able to see the radiation come to a certain point, um, we now have this view that sounds a lot like the moment of creation in biblical scriptures. And I um, I found it fascinating when I read the book God and the Astronomers by uh, Robert Jastrow, who was a NASA scientist, and he wrote in his book that uh, for the scientist who lived out his faith in the power of reason the story ended like a bad dream. He scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> and, and I do find it fascinating. Um, also, he also says in the book that it turns out that the scientist behaves the way that the rest of us do when our beliefs are in conflict with the evidence. They become irritated. They pretend that conflict doesn't exist or we paper it over with meaningless phrases. But what I find is happening now is that science is having to come to terms because as we study more and more non-material reality, um, we are realizing that it's our own minds that are affecting this uh, material form of reality and that it's not only validating um, the ancient scriptures, um, but it's 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 uh, creating a reemergence of these earlier discoveries that you're talking about in the 19th century, uh, early 20th centuries, uh, when this stuff was uh, more accepted and it it wasn't um, a protected paradigm to to you know toss away or, or sequester. Do you feel that there is a a scientific revolution coming in terms of a spiritual um, revolution? Maybe that science is going to have to admit that something's going on here but be it besides materialism well i i definitely think there there is however uh i mean we we also have to be honest about you know some some things as well i think the current position of mainstream orthodox science is something like the position of uh, the Communist Party and the Soviet Union and the East European countries, say in the 1970s or early 1980s, uh, they were still firmly in control of the power structures, you know, the military, the police, the education system, the economy. They're pretty much in control of that officially, but the people themselves had entirely different ideas, and even in their own ranks, there were people who had doubts about what they were doing and ideas about what they would rather be doing. So uh, it, it wasn't a very stable situation, even though officially they were pretty much in in control. So how I would look at 
how that applies to the current situation regarding mainstream science is that yes they are pretty much still in control they have government enforced monopolies in the education systems in most countries and uh, even though there is opposition within their own ranks either open or hidden uh, they're still pretty much in control of of that even though there may be minorities of scientists with other ideas and as far as the general public is concerned gallup surveys have shown that huge huge numbers of people in the united states and in other countries hold beliefs about ufos and paranormal phenomena and the origin of human species and things like that that contradict what uh, the mainstream scientific community is saying so uh, i don't think it's a, a very stable situation that uh, the people in general have ideas that contradict what the scientific community is saying uh, that even within their own ranks there are people who are having doubts about the nature of what it is they're trying to do so i don't think it's a very stable situation and i think eventually things <clears throat> are going to change and it may take place uh, in a, a more rapid way than we can now imagine but at the same time i said as i said they are still pretty much right in in control of well, da the, david the official, Bur official institution so uh, we'll see what happens with that. Yeah, I, I believe that we are witnessing a, the death of Darwinism, and I believe that in order for us to advance um, as a collective, as a species, we have to um, we have to be aware that we are not physical, material beings. I don't believe that the collective humanity can rise above its um, its current state without expanding its idea of what it is and. Um, David Berlinski has a, a famous quote saying that Darwin's theory of evolution is the last of the great 19th century mystery re religions. As we speak, it is now following Freudians and Marxism into the nether regions. And he's quite sure that Freud and Marxist and Darwin are commiserating one with another in a dark dungeon where discarded gods gather. And I, I find that such a perfect a, uh, quote because it, it's to me describing what I'm seeing with this emerging intelligent design movement in science, the uh, the rediscovery of, of the quantum physicists and the um, the scientists that began um, all of these endeavors back in the 19th century, they all believed that this was more um, describing um, what they would call God's creation as opposed to explaining away that it wasn't something um, like a being that was creating anything. It was trying to do uh, to basically describe away the concept of God. And now I believe we're coming around full circle and we're trying to um, connect the sciences with the ancient mythos that I believe we've all kind of walked away from. Do you feel that, that, sci that science is, is going to lead us into a new type of religious uh, view of ourselves? Or do you believe that um, something else will lead us there? What, what's your view on the role of science as we move forward in the next 20, 30, or 40 years and start looking at more non-material um, non -material things and how that affects reality. I, I think I, I have a positive view that progress is possible. But, you know, we have to look at the fact that, say, around four or five hundred years ago, if we go, go back four or five hundred years in Europe and we look at the scientific picture of reality it included subtle energies consciousness uh different kinds of vitalist and 
ideas, that there's a life force, that there is some higher control uh, design in the in the in the cosmos and things like that. If you go back to that time period, you'll see that. But at that time, scientists made a big decision. Uh, they decided they wanted to focus on ordinary matter operating according to mathematically described laws and in a way that ruled out uh, any kind of influence by higher and more subtle beings, whether it's God or God's agents. They just wanted to focus on ordinary matter operating according to mathematically predictable laws. So no non-material substances, no intelligence or design or other higher beings having anything to do with the process. So it was very a very successful move that they made, but it was at the expense of not having a complete picture of reality. You know, so it was very profitable in the sense that by focusing on matter, they were able to get a very good understanding of ordinary matter and how it operates. And on that basis, they were able to uh, develop technologies. They were able to control matter in certain ways. So they were able to come up with better weapons, mm -hmm. which governments liked very much. <laughs> yes. So they supported it. So they supported right. it. They were able to come up with effective pharmaceuticals. So medical industry loved that. They were able to come up with consumer with technologies that resulted in products that could be sold, manufactured and sold. So industry loved that. So it was sort of a devil's bargain, you could say, you know, between the governments and the scientists and the industrialists and the medical industry. They, they all got what they wanted and, and the general populace also kind of bought into it uh, to a, a certain extent. And it's been very profitable for everyone involved. You know, the governments get the weapons they want uh, and, and industry gets the products it wants. The medical companies get the pharmaceuticals they want and uh, we, the general public, are along for the ride. Mm -hmm. So everybody's kind of bought into it. Right. But it's at the expense of not having a complete picture of reality. And because of that, there are so many problems in the world. We're destroying the planet uh, environmentally. We're engaged in huge levels of conflict on all levels of human society because we've divided ourselves up into competing groups to sh struggle for more material production and, and consumption. So if, right. so if we had a different kind of science that was more consciousness based, we would begin to realize, hey, I'm a being of pure consciousness. You're a being of pure consciousness. Let's not divide ourselves up into so many competing groups. Let's find the most simple, natural, and efficient way to satisfy our material needs. And you know, we'd be able to solve the environmental crisis, solve the problem of uh, violence and war and competition in the world, but it would require a new kind of science based on on different principles. And I think that's possible, mm -hmm. but yeah, 
And it seems to be happening to a certain degree. We do have um, new sciences that are being allowed to emerge. And this is where I want to shift into your more human uh, devolution book, which is, I believe, the, the second part of your, um, your endeavor. And, and